Good morning. Welcome to Orange Coast Unitarian Universalist Church on Zoom. My name is Steve Morihiro, and I am your worship associate today. It is my great pleasure to be joined by our minister, the Reverend Sean Wilshire, and our director of music ministries, Beth Syverson, in welcoming you this morning. We are also joined by guest musician Jan Maybe, who will be performing live music for us with Beth this morning. Reverend Judy Tomlinson, our Director of Religious Education already held classes for the children earlier this morning, and she will offer one for our youth after the service. At this time, let us respectfully recognize that our church property rests on a Hashiman and Tongba land. I would like to invite you to open the chat box, and if you haven't done so already, send out a greeting to everybody. We'll be turning the chat off during the sermon portion of the service so as not to distract, but we'll turn it back on later in the service. As Unitarian Universalists, we have many different beliefs, but we are one loving community. We are bound together not by a common set of rules or beliefs, but rather a covenant. A covenant is simply a promise, a promise that whatever our beliefs, we accept one another and encourage each other in spiritual growth. We affirm that all life has inherent value and that all existence is interconnected. We strive for justice and compassion in our deeds and relationships, and we are committed to creating a welcoming community without regard to the traits that sometimes divide people. I want to extend a special welcome to visitors. If you are seeking a spiritual home, we hope that you will find it here. Shortly after the service ends, we will be placing everyone who remains into Zoom breakout rooms for 20 minutes of coffee and conversation. Everyone is welcome to participate in these breakout rooms. It's a great way to get to know other people in the congregation. Our worship begins with the lighting of our chalice, which is the symbol of the Unitarian Universalist tradition. As we light it, we say our unison affirmation. If you have a chalice or candle at home, we can light them together. Please join me now as we say, love is the spirit of this church and services its law, to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to help one another. This we affirm together. Please join me in our opening song. Thank you. 
call to worship this morning is a true story that comes from us from uh, John Lewis, a civil rights leader and a longtime member of the House of Representatives. I thought that would be an appropriate person to lead us in our service today. Um, if you didn't know John Lewis, an amazing, amazing man, grew up in a large family and he would spend time with his aunts or uncles, with his siblings and cousins, and there were many children in the neighborhood and they'd all play together. And Mr. Lewis tells us in the story about a time when he was playing outside at, at his aunt uh, Seneva's house with about 14 other children when a huge storm hits and it's a terrifying storm. So Lewis wrote this. Aunt Seneva was the only adult around. And as the sky blackened and the winds grew stronger, she herded us all inside. Her house was not the biggest place around and it seemed even smaller with so many children squeezed inside. Small and surprisingly quiet. All of the shouting and laughter that had been going on early outside had stopped. The wind was howling now and the house was starting to shake. We were scared. Even Aunt Seneva was scared. And then it got worse. Now the house was beginning to sway. The wood planks flooring beneath us began to bend. And then a corner of the house started lifting up. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. None of us could. This storm was actually pulling the house toward the sky with us in it. That was when Aunt Seneva told us to clasp hands. Line up and hold hands, she said, and we did as we were told. Then she had us walk as a group toward the corner of the room that was rising. From the kitchen to the front of the house we walked, the wind screaming outside, sheets of rain beating on the tin roof. Then we walked back in the other direction as another end of the house began to lift. And so it went back and forth. 15 children walking with the wind, holding that trembling house down with the weight of our small bodies. He continues, more than a half a century has passed since that day and it has struck me more than once over those many years that our society is not unlike the children in that house rocked again and again by the winds of one storm or another, the walls around us seeming at times as if they might fly apart. It seems that way in the 1960s at the height of the civil rights movement when America itself felt as if it might burst at the seams, so much tension, so many storms, but the people of conscience never left the house. They never ran away. They stayed, they came together and they did the best they could, clasping hands and moving toward the corner of the house that was the weakest. And then another corner would lift and we would go there. And eventually, inevitably, the storm would settle and the house would still stand. But we knew another storm would come and we would have to do it all over again. And we did, and we still do, all of us, you and I, children holding hands, walking with the wind.
Ah, our reading today, I don't usually quote from the Bible, but I thought the story of Exodus was rather appropriate. What I had actually planned an entirely different sermon, but um, and was going to use this for an entirely different reason, but then I realized how appropriate it was for what's been going on this week. This is the story of the golden calf in Exodus 32, 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron, the priest, and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. Aaron said to them, Okay, take off the gold rings that are on your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, bring them to me. So they all the people took off their gold rings and brought them to Aaron. And he took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, hey, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made the proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. And they rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. I invite you in a spirit of meditation to think about this reading and this moment in history. Let's take some deep breaths. We're going to get into some stuff today. Let's get a little centered. How is it? How is it that people create idols and why do they create them? And what is this wisdom from so long ago trying to tell us today? When you're ready, you're invited to join Beth in singing. This week's been an eventful one. Now, many of you have been coming to this church for a pretty long time, and you know that I rarely, rarely ever mention the president. And there's there's two reasons that you need to know about this. And one of them is a legal reason, and the other one is a personal reason. The, re 
The legal issue is that as a 501c3 nonprofit religious organization, we are not allowed by law to influence any vote for any particular candidate. We can talk about issues as much as we want, but in no, in, we can't in any way tell someone to vote for one party or candidate or, or another. So that's the legal issue. The personal reason is that while I have never respected the man in the office, I have respected the office of the presidency and our democracy. And as much as I may not have liked it, how much I'm actually repelled by the thought, he was and is the duly elected president of the United States. But the election is over. And after Wednesday, I'm done. I'm just done. The muzzle is coming off. Trump has repeatedly lied for four years to the American public. He has denied truce. He has undermined the free press and mocked our institutions. He is a misogynist, racist, ableist demagogue who panders to people's fears. He is a malignant narcissist who encouraged and inflamed a mob to violate and desecrate one of the greatest symbols of democracy around the world. He is a traitor to our country and a danger to us all. I hope I'm clear about how I feel. And I'm done being nice. I am enraged. And I hope you are too. Yes, I do have worries about our future and all of that, but right now I am furious. And I who preach love and tolerance, acceptance of one another, reach out across the aisle. Let's start conversations and try to understand one another. I'm done. There is no getting through to the people who rioted, mocked, and desecrated our country's greatest gift to the world, our democracy. And they don't want that hand reaching out. They slap it away. For four years, the press have been trying to show President Trump and his followers the light of truth to expose his misogynistic, racist, egotistical, greedy, capitalistic ways. And almost half the nation have turned a deaf ear, making excuses. Oh, but he's good at business. So clean up the swamp. He sold them a bill of goods and they have bought it. And why, why would they listen to such a panderer? Fear, anxiety, not knowing the way forward like the people in Exodus. That's the lesson of the golden calf. So they created this false God, an idol. He became their golden calf, an idol to be worshiped and have complete belief in no matter what he says. He's raised himself up as the supreme leader to not be questioned, and people have reveled in this new God who makes them feel powerful over the powerless, who validates their paranoid fantasies. And how did he do this? Social media, Facebook, and Twitter have allowed extremist lies to be perpetuated and validated. If these platforms didn't exist, no way the events on Wednesday would have happened. The extreme right fringe conspiracy theorists were able to spread their lies and then to organize. They brought zip ties to bind people, bombs and guns. And here's the thing, I don't care that these people truly thought they were saving democracy by disrupting the voting. They were wrong, they were wrong. They have created for themselves a deliberate ignorance, slapping away any thought or hand that reaches out to them with the truth or with reality. They choose to stay in their fantasy world because in that world, they're heroes. They can feel good about themselves when the world is calling them racist and sexist. And rather than having the courage to face their shadow, they deliberately turn away from it. As their power crumbles around them, as their privilege is being taken away and revealed for what it is, they have built wild conspiracy theories and fantasies that validate their God. And I'm here to tell you, we've all been guilty of denial of, but, but, I'll, but let's, let's put this in perspective, not to the extent that we go against every scrap of evidence that, and even just common sense, there is a level of denial and ignorance that cannot be excused. Our country is under the spell of mass radicalization. 45% of all conservatives believe that Wednesday was justified. Not all, not all. What fascinates me is that 35, prior to the election, 35% of conservatives believed that the election was rigged. 
And afterwards, when they lost, spurred on by the president, that number rose, doubled, it went to 70%. That's scary. Our democracy is under attack and its weapon is lies. We, we Unitarian Universalists, we affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. That's our fourth principle. Free, yes, everyone has the right to freedom to believe as they are. But don't forget that word responsible. That means we have to look at all sides. We have to look at all the evidence. And this is one of the reasons why I honestly, I regularly read and listen to Fox News. I want to understand. And sometimes I'll even concede them some points like, yeah, okay, that's a little overblown here on this side. Yeah, I get that. The liberal press is not without its flaws, but they don't blatantly lie. And I, and better people than me, have researched the evidence for voter fraud and not one scrap of evidence of any widespread problems, none. And this has been looked at by both parties, by judges, investigators, lawyers, by both parties. And to ignore that, common sense, it's outrageous and it's dangerous, it's seditious. And I am just done, my people, I am done. So where do we go from here? People are asking this, how do we heal from this, from this violation of our democracy? How do we build trust in the democratic institutions, which is by no means perfect, but it's still a democracy that just spent the last four years being trampled on, being eroded. Where do we go from here? And you know, there's always that go-to answer for me. And sometimes I just, I want to resist it. I've been wanting to resist it, but I'm still going to go there because the answer is always love. It's the only healing force in the universe that can handle fear and hate. But I'm not rushing to certain forms of love. I'm not talking about rushing to forgiveness and compassion. Oh, they're just afraid. Oh, you know, let's, let's have compassion. It's not the time to reach out across the aisle to hold hands and sing Kumbaya, try to educate people with facts and strong listening skills. We tried that, it didn't work. Because love is not just about the warm fuzzy feelings or about just listening with a compassionate heart. The other side has to be open to that. You know what love is? Love is also justice. Love is boundaries. And even anger can be love. So let's talk about that kind of love today. Yes, anger as love. When it's righteous, it can be a healthy love. Now, righteous means standing with love against something that is morally unjust. I know people don't like that word righteous, mostly because they think of the word self-righteous, which is something entirely different. Or we don't like the word anger because it's often associated with violence and maybe in our own lives, it's been that way. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a righteous anger that shuns violence and asks us, calls us, urges us, pushes us to act with love. And what do those acts look like? They look like justice, and they look like boundaries. So what am I talking about? Well, I've been trying to figure this out myself. Eric Bjorland is an expert in democratic elections. He has written books and studied and reported on, monitored and writes about the spread of democracy around the world. On Thursday, he wrote an editorial for The Economist. The title was America, welcome to the ranks of struggling democracies. And from his vantage point, he has some great advice for us. He's seen democracies fall apart. He's seen what happens when mobs try to take over, when radicalization and lies take over. And he knows what needs to happen next for these democracies to survive. And the first thing he says is the criminal justice system must hold the perpetrators to account. The criminal justice system must hold the perpetrators to account. Failure to do so leads to more violence as people know they can get away with it. In other countries who's failed to do this has led to the murder of journalists, politicians, and elected officials. The second thing he says is that there must be an immediate political response. 
And by that, he means the politicians who have excited such acts, including the president, the senators, the representatives, all must be accounted for and made pariahs. That's his word, pariahs. Their political careers must be over. There must be an unequivocal message that this type of populist lying, fear mongering and manipulation of the public will not be tolerated. And of course, Trump should be impeached, if not jailed. Not that I think either of those necessarily are going to happen, but I believe that they should. Even though it's like just in the last two weeks, but it's so that his political career is completely over. His throne, his pedestal, his altar is toppled. Okay, now I know I'm talking a lot about politics and we try to have politics and religion and state, you know, separation of certain things, they're not supposed to mix, but let's get real here for a moment. My job is not necessarily to be a talking head like the news pundits, but my job is to evoke moral reflection. And I cannot do that if we keep our heads buried in the ground. A great moral injustice has been done to our country and I'll be damned, sorry for the swearing, I'll be damned if I sit by and say nothing. Would you ask King to stop calling out politicians in the civil rights movement? No, although some did. <laughs> this is an issue we need to talk about. Our president is unfit for duty and quite frankly, always has been. And I know many of you and me are struggling with what to do next. I wanna give you some advice by a, a wonderful colleague of mine. Many of you know him, it's the Reverend Jason Cook, who's actually now the uh, Reverend Doctor. Jason Cook. He's our minister in Fullerton, and he's written his doctorate on narcissism. He wrote this for our colleagues. He posted it in the uh, minister's chat about what we're witnessing at this time. And he says this, this is normal, folks. Well, normal in one sense. For anyone who has ever been in relationship with a full-fledged malignant narcissist or had a deeply narcissistic boss or has a narcissistic for a parent or sibling, you know. When things don't go a narcissist's wage, way, they rage, and they often have narcissistic supply around them. These are people who have bought into the narcissistic way of thinking, placing the often charismatic narcissist at the center of their emotional world. In their minds, nothing is ever the narcissist's fault. One of the things a narcissist hates is to be removed from power or left behind or broken up with. They rage. The remaining narcissistic supports rages in their defense. They'll destroy all they can on the way out or seek to destroy you on your way out. He continues, what can you do to protect yourself? Well, the number one thing is to not engage. You aren't going to change them for the better by staying in relationship with them. You'll simply deplete your own emotional resources and sense of self-worth. Cutting off all contact with a malignant narcissist and potentially their supporters is the best form of self-protection there is. Another way of putting it, boundaries. And that is an act of love for yourself and for others. You know, Twitter and Facebook finally did something about that and shut him down, hopefully for good. And that is an example of boundaries. Disengaging is also about taking care of yourself. Raging at the narcissist support network isn't going to help you, though it may feel a little cathartic. <laughs> I understand that. But you know what? Here's the thing that breaks my heart is that many people have been asking me since Wednesday about friends, family, and colleagues who are Trump supporters. Or maybe they just voted for him, but also maybe they know those that are the diehard MAGA hats. And they're asking how can I be in a relationship with them? Should I unfriend them on Facebook? How can I even look at that person who voted for Trump? And of course, each decision has to be made individually. I don't know your relationships. But here's a couple of pieces of advice that I give you. First, I would suggest not making a decision right away. We're all pretty upset and angry. <laughs> yeah, we are. Second, unfriending on Facebook, it's, it does two things. First of all, it does isolate them even more, their sounding board, their echo chamber. And that's not good. 
But on the other hand, it also protects you from their unhealthy behavior, which is good. And so you have to decide what you can handle or not handle. And if you want to engage with someone who is, in my opinion, delusional, I don't suggest doing it directly. Send them a post, send them an article. If their post talks about how the virus is fake and wearing masks is a violation of freedom, send them someone else's argument. Don't try to engage in a conversation because it's not going to work. If you're having a meal with them and politics comes up, put up immediate strong boundaries. I don't want to listen to your excuses or lies for that is what they are. That's tough to say to a loved one, isn't it? But that's strong boundaries and that's what we need right now. And I don't normally advocate shutting people down but until justice is served and those that put Trump in power are no longer spreading lies, we're not going to change minds. And I do believe that there will come a time when, when people realize how they were duped. And then there are going to be feelings of shame and grief. And we can reach out there. And we've all been there. I was almost actually inducted into a cult at one point. <laughs> and I remember that feeling of like, ew, what happened? You know, I'm reminded of the people in fundamentalist churches who, you know, realize their minister has betrayed their trust, right? We've seen those big bank of churches and suddenly, you know, I don't know, they're off having affairs or they're doing something that betrays their trust. It's this huge sense of betrayal and even shame. Now, some will always stay with the narcissist, the betrayer, because they can't face what that feels like. But for those who are strong enough, they will grieve and mourn, and then we can heal. But until then, take care of yourself. I do have compassion for those that I believe I've been completely deluded, who can't let go of their golden calf. But I'm not going to model coddle them either. We have to put up boundaries around them, the president, and those who supported him. We will get to compassion. It is deserving of compassion. We will get to healing and back to reaching out, but justice and accountability have to come first. That is for our nation to rebuild our democracy in order for this nation to heal. Because here's the thing about love, right? We think of it as this warm, loving feeling, you know, just fuzzies and everything, but there is strength. There is justice. It is relentless. It is not giving up. I am not giving up and neither are you. Love is not going anywhere and we're going to keep hangering at our doors until we answer. It will ask us to stand up, to speak out, reach out, get angry, create justice, set boundaries, and it will ask us to say no. Because until people are ready to hear truth, to reconcile, to heal, and to repent and atone for the harm they have done, we can only watch and say no, no. And so here we are in the middle of a huge storm in this country. And the foundations of our democracy are shaking. They're beginning to lift up the roots of the foundations of our country. But hand in hand, we're going walking over and we're going to shore it up again with the weight of our bodies, our votes, and our acts of justice. And when another storm comes, we're going to walk to the other part of that democratic house and shore it up. Because that's what people of conscience do. We don't give up. We are relentless. I began with the words of John Lewis, so let me end with them as well. Walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. Let us sing. Sing with me loud and strong. The tide is rising, and so
Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Reverend Sean. Unitarian Universalist congregations are fully self-supporting, meaning that members and friends raise all funds for the operating budget, ministries, and programs of the church. We are ever grateful for your gifts of time, treasure, and talent. OCUUC amplifies that spirit of generosity by sharing one half of the plate we receive with an organization that shares our values. Throughout the month of January, we are supporting Stand Up for Kids, Orange County. Information about this org organization is on the screen. Their mission statement is ending the cycle of youth homelessness. We do this in cities across America, one youth at a time. Their vision is we strive to build communities where all youth know care, feel loved, and have a support system to help them move quickly from surviving to thriving. Please give generously so that this organization can help these youth to take one more step toward thriving. There are three ways in which you can give online. The first is through our website, www.ocuuc.org. The second, through an app called Give. You can download it from the app store for your smartphone and once you've set it up, you can use it for any of your online giving, including your pledge. The third method is by texting area code 714-942-1131. Simply text to that number and in the message, type the amount. As always, thank you for your generosity as the offering is given and received. My mother, when love is gone, my mother, when love is gone, in our darkest hour, oh, playing your song, my father, when peace is gone, my father, when peace is gone, in our darkest hour, oh, playing your song. When equality's gone, my sister. When equality's gone, in our darkest hour, hope lingers on. My brother, with tolerance gone, my brother. With tolerance gone, in our darkest hour, hope lingers on. Our darkest hour, hope lingers 
Please join Beth in singing We Gather Together, a song that puts our intentions into words and expresses our gratitude for the many gifts we share. Take a few deep breaths. How about we do that? We're entering in a time where we're researching and searching inside of our hearts to what we're holding dearly there. This is our weekly ritual called joys and sorrows, really any emotion <laughs> ritual that we're feeling deep in our heart. And you are invited, one and all, whether you're a member, a friend, or a visitor to participate in this ritual. So if you're holding something close in your heart that has struck you from the last days, weeks, or hours, if you'd like to honor such profound joy or sorrow, we just invite you to do so. And you can do this by lighting a candle at home. It's a wonderful way to honor what you hold in your heart. But if you'd like to share your joy or sorrow with the congregation, you can write that in the chat. So let's take a few moments in contemplation as Beth plays some music and then I'll begin reading joys and sorrows out loud. And please forgive me if I miss one, you can help me by waiting to type comments to any expressed joy or sorrow until we're finished. It's hard to sometimes I scroll by really quick. Thank you. He said he appreciates the work of Judith Stamper in the Adopt the Family Project and that of Sarah Hunter in the Giving to Others Project. And during this Black History Month, Ralph also remembers his friend, the late Dr. Vincent Harding, who worked with the Reverend Dr. Luck, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And Clover and Paul light a candle and send healing thoughts to their son-in-law, Brendan Beach, who is suffering from a very severe strep throat. Peggy is lighting a candle of hope that our country will heal. Amen, sister. Marilyn expresses a joy. She felt she liked the sermon. Way to show good and well-placed anger. Uh, it's, um, anger does not come naturally for me. And Joan is getting a candle of hope for her husband in the middle of a potentially serious health scare. Oh, Joan, yes, we hold him in your hearts. And Charlene is excited about facilitating the sermon discussion group on Tuesday on this sermon. And Chip is expressing sorrow for this country. It's divided and sore need of justice to heal. <sighs> You're welcome. And Carolina, she's scared for our country. Yes, I am too. Barbara lets us know that one of her nieces just tested positive for COVID. She works in a skilled nursing facility. Oh, her symptoms are mild. I pray they stay that way. Yes, don't we all? I'm sorry, Barbara, to hear that. 
Yeah. And Carol, she lit a candle of hope for our divided country. Yes. May it please, please heal sooner than later. Hannah, a candle of gratitude for discovering this community and all of us here, even though she's all the way in Minneapolis. We're glad you're here with us. Yulis, a candle of hope that love is relentless. It is, it is, it doesn't give up. And Jordan has a joy. He got a new sponsor in his AA program that's local. He'll have four years sober next year. He says, I have amazing friends and I'm happy. But he has a sorrow that not everyone makes it in an hour. It's my best friend Chase's memorial in an hour who passed away from an accidental overdose. He says he's grateful for the service and for Unitarian Universalism. Sarah Hunter is little a candle for the great things and the hard things. It is to stick to things that you've outlived the first interest and not yet got the second, which comes as a sort of mastery. Oh, that's a quote from Janet Erskine Stewart. The great thing and the hard thing is to stick to things when you have outlived the first interest and not yet got the second, which comes as a sort of mastery. I'm not entirely what to think of that, but I, I like the quote, it's lovely. So Sue said, said, grateful for the sermon and the music. She says, I pray for us and demand justice regarding the attack on our capital and elected officials. Dave has a candle of joy. He says for his son, Eric's vigil in front of his church when no indictment for the offer that officer that shot Jacob Blake in the back seven times. Your son is a beacon, Dave. And Sunny says that her ex is going into hospice and she wants to support her son and daughter. Absolutely, that's so hard to lose a parent. I'm glad you're there for them, Sunny. Kathleen has lit a candle of sorrow for her daughter-in-law who has two extended family members pass away in the last week from COVID. Oh, I'm so sorry, Kathleen. It's horrible what's happening. And Linda, Linda Clough has voiced what many of us hope that healing will begin on January 20th. Let's hope, let's hope. Oh, let us hold and love all the joys and celebrations, all the hurts and sadness, whether it's been spoken or it's silent, let our joys, these are universal things, all these joys remind us to be thankful, our concerns remind us to hope, our sorrows remind us to connect. Let all these moments remind us that we are not alone. Oh, Ken, I'm sorry I missed you, or is that Thon's uh, cousin lost her husband and mother-in-law to COVID? So sorry. I invite you all to join me in a spirit of prayer that was written by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Nguyen of our Unitarian Universalist Association. It's a prayer for protection. A prayer for protection for Black, Indigenous, Muslim, Latina elected officials, for the residents of Washington, D.C., for everyone who was frightened that evening for each of us who has ever been handcuffed or tear gassed or afraid of police or white supremacists or our government. For each of us who was afraid every day for ourselves or our loved ones or our children or this country, may we be protected. May we be protected from generations of violence and hate, from pandemic and sickness and fear. May those of us who can be protectors May we protect, be pourers of tea for ourselves and others, builders of power for love for ourselves and others, reminders to breathe and eat and fight and tend to rest and risk so we may all be protected. And in our doubt and stress, may we rest in the air and the earth and the sky that have seen governments come and go, despots and haters come and go, that hold our bones and our breath with sacredness and survival. 
from the words of the senator-elect Reverend Raphael Warnock, we, will we play political games while real people suffer? Or will we win righteous fights together shoulder to shoulder? Will we seek to destroy one another or heed the call towards the common good, building together what Dr. King called the beloved community? May there be protection and justice. May it be shoulder to shoulder. May it be beloved community. This is our prayer. Amen. Let us join together as we extinguish the flame of our chalice. We extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We are a congregation made up of people who all believe differently. And yet, when we gather together, virtually or otherwise, we make up one loving community. We need not think alike to love alike. If you are a guest, a visitor, or someone who hasn't yet been known to us, I invite you to become a part of this beloved community, if even just for today. We encourage you to write in the chat your name and where you are from. If you'd like to know more about our church, please see our church website for ways you can get involved and sign up for our weekly email called The Blast at blast at ocuuc.org. If you would like to know more about membership, please contact us at membership at ocuuc.org. And for information about programming for children and youth, contact revjudy at ocuuc.org. Our community is enriched by its visitors, guests, and friends, and we hope that you find a spiritual home here. We want everyone to feel a part of this beloved community so please reach out and we will help you to get connected. After the benediction, we will have a short period where everyone can wave and say hello. Those who remain will be placed into Zoom breakout groups for 20 minutes. We invite you to check in and get to know the people in your group and welcome any visitors. Ah, oh, and the life of the church goes on. I want to invite you to show you that there's a lot of things going on. Of course, here in the life of the church, we've got our wonderful Rika Koffel, our intern is being ordained in uh, two weeks as of yesterday. So we're gonna be doing that. We have a town hall meeting coming up. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that we are doing a Martin Luther King Day of Service. Now this might seem a little bit strange. We've done days of service before, uh, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so uh, Sarah Hunter in her wisdom and creativity is uh, putting together two things that we can be involved in. One of which is donating to Mercy House. She created it really easy. Uh, if you go to the blast, you can see there's a link there where you, uh, she's actually created an Amazon wish list. So you can just go buy things to donate if you like. Uh, we can then, she'll bring it over then to Mercy House. Um, the other thing uh, that we can do if, if, you know, not everybody has the finances to be able to do that, but we all have some time hopefully on our hands and you can write letters to seniors um, that are in nursing homes, something to lift their spirits during this time. And she has a list on our website of uh, various nursing homes that would be happy to receive your letters of encouragement and love. And I really suggest um, that you do. And she, oh, she's put it in the chat that she needs some suggestions of senior living homes. Um, and so if you know of some people, by all means do that as well. But that'll be our day of service on Monday, the 18th. I encourage you all to come out and just take a moment to remember King and do something in service um, in, in all of the ways that he served this country so that we may honor that. So let us join Beth in singing our benediction. Walk with the wind, my friends, my people, and may the power of everlasting love be your guide. This service is over. Let our service continue. Relentless light.